Good morning, good afternoon. Um, my name is John Major. I'm going to be talking about applications, uh, specifically reinsurance applications, but I'm not going to limit myself to that. Let's uh, talk about the use cases for spectral risk measures. Uh, principally fall in these kind of four areas. Uh, of course, pricing, that's what we've been focusing on, is pricing. Uh, policy pricing, this is actually a technical premium or a reservation price. It's uh, to give you an idea of what premium you need, at the very least, to pay for your risk. Uh, other applications involve the lines of business, a higher level of granularity, larger level of granularity than the policy. Uh, what lines of business are pulling their weight? Uh, are they getting adequate premium as a line of business? Um, where do you want to grow or shrink uh, as, a, as a result of your ability to achieve your required premiums in a line of business? Uh, then there's a line of business capital cost allocation. You have your overall cost of capital and for uh, internal management, uh, virtual accounting purposes, you might want to have to allocate that capital cost back to your lines of business. And of course, spectral risk measure is the obvious way to do that. And then finally, reinsurance decisions. Uh, design of reinsurance, so selecting whether or not you want to purchase a certain contract, uh, what the right price might be for that contract, uh, uh, how to uh, construct an optimal configuration of reinsurance out of the options being uh, offered to you, that sort of thing. Now, there, it, it should have been clear, but I'm going to emphasize it now, there are two principal modes for using spectral risk measures. One uh, we call kind of the A-B method. Uh, you're going to evaluate a spectral risk measure on a particular portfolio, and then you're going to also evaluate it on an alternative portfolio, uh, a portfolio that you, you might be considering transforming your portfolio into by whatever means, uh, changing your mix of business, applying reinsurance or whatever. So you have a situation where you have portfolio A, portfolio B, or uh, perhaps portfolio gross, portfolio net, and you evaluate them both and you say, okay, which one uh, is, uh, you know, which one has the lower cost of risk to me? Uh, other things taken into consideration. The other mode is the allocation mode, to use a natural allocation. So you'll start with, uh, say, the gross portfolio, and then you will look within that uh, at a sub portion, a sub portfolio, say the seeded cash flows, and say, okay, I'm going to have the total. Uh, cost, the total required premium for the portfolio, what portion of that uh, is, is to be allocated to the seeded portion. Uh, so you have two distinctly different methods of uh, applying spectral risk measures. Now let's, let's go back to the use cases and see how that might work out, uh, which ones are appropriate. Okay, so for policy pricing, um, the A-B method is impractical unless you have a small number of policies and, and nobody wants a small number of policies. So you have hundreds of thousands of policies. It's not going to be practical to rerun uh, alternative with and without uh, the policy to, uh, to, to do an A-B test. Um, you know, my portfolio today, uh, my portfolio, if I added this policy to it, uh, compare the two. That's just not practical. So for there, you want to do the allocation method. It's uh, much more uh, feasible to do allocation on a thousand or ten thousand or a hundred thousand policies. Uh, line of business assessment, um, it depends on how many lines of business you're talking about. If you're, if you're breaking it down to, um, you know, uh, a, a countable, you know, count on your both hands kind of number, uh, it might be practical to do an A, B, uh, kind of a, a Shapley value kind of a computation, the portfolio with and portfolio without the line of business to see how it compares. But it's definitely, uh, definitely more practical to use the allocation method uh, at the line of business, and especially if you're getting up to 50, 100 uh, components to your, your line of business breakdown. Capital cost allocation, uh, it's not, you know, the A, B method is not useful here because uh, allocation uh, is going to add up costs, uh, but the AB method is not going to be additive. Uh, so you know, allocating costs through the AB method just doesn't make any sense. You're going to use the allocation method for that. And then reinsurance decisions. Uh, actually, both methods uh, have something uh, going for them, and I'm going to illustrate this shortly. Okay, so we're going to take a case study. 
Uh, we're going to use reinsurance to minimize our total cost of risk. Uh, that is to say, the, uh, the spectral risk measure required premium on our portfolio plus whatever out-of-pocket we need uh, for, to pay for reinsurance. And that's the total cost. So we're going to have a very simple portfolio, two lines of business uh, with four scenarios, uh, and a very simple excess of loss contract available on one of the lines. And we'll illustrate operating in these two modes uh, of using spectral risk measures. Okay, so here, here's our simple example. We have uh, our gross portfolio on the left. We have line one and line two, uh, four scenarios, uh, the sum of them being uh, XG, the gross loss. And then we have the probabilities. So there's a 70% probability that we're going to get minimal loss of one on each of those for a total portfolio loss of two. And then 10% uh, probability for each of the other three uh, scenarios. Now our reinsurance uh, again applies to X1 only. This is a 2 excess of 2. So the seeded flows are 0 in the first two uh, scenarios. Uh, seeding 2 in scenario 3 where we have an X1 loss of 4 uh, and seeding 1 in the, the last scenario. Now, now and notice here where uh, we've sorted our scenarios in the total gross loss uh, column, uh, which is not the same ordering as the net loss column. This will be important later. So our uh, X1 net flows are 1, 2, 2, 2. Uh, X2 flows are the same. And then our net flows 2, 5, 4, 6. Uh, let me just point out there that uh, 2, 5, 4, 6 is not in order. That will be important. Uh, for a distortion function, we're going to use this very simple one. Uh, it's a constant ROE for 20% uh, to 100% uh, exceedance probabilities. And then for uh, higher return periods over on the left, uh, we're going to use a straight line decreasing, uh, decreasing G function, decreasing ROE. Um, this was just picked for simplicity. Uh, I know Steve, uh, Steve doesn't like this one because uh, it's not, uh, it doesn't uh, respect uh, tail stochastic dominance. Uh, so uh, if we're doing something more realistic, we'd have a, we'd have a curve to that. But that, be that as it may, that's the, that's the function we're using. And so uh, AB mode, we're going to AB the gross and net positions and say which one has the lower total cost. Okay, so the gross valuation, we're going to take our gross loss, uh, gross scenarios 2, 5, 6, 7. Uh, with the other columns here, we're, we have our uh, probabilities P, we have our exceedance probabilities S, uh, we're applying our distortion to get our distorted exceedance probabilities G of S, and then finally our individual distorted probabilities in the final column. Uh, this corresponds to the distorted version of the P column. And then a simple uh, sum product cross multiplication gives us a, a gross required premium of 3.63. Okay, and there's no, we haven't applied any reinsurance, so there's no cost of reinsurance. So 3.63 is the required premium on this portfolio. Now the net valuation, uh, we have to take our net uh, losses and we have to sort on those so that when we calculate our G of S, uh, calculate our S and then our G of S, we're doing it with respect to the net portfolio losses. Uh, in this case, because uh, all of the P's are 10% on the final three scenarios, and the sorting is only going on in there, it doesn't look like anything's changed in the P, S, or G of S, or D, G columns. Uh, what it looks like is that the, the, the net loss column has changed. Uh, in a more complicated situation, the, these other numbers would actually be changing. And again, a simple cross-multiplication, we get 3.239 uh, as the required premium on net. So let's take a look. All right, so net premium 3.239. Our cost of reinsurance, I don't know if I mentioned that earlier, was uh, 0.38 is what they were charging us. Uh, if, uh, if you had been paying attention before, the, uh, the expected seeded loss was 30.3. So there is a risk premium uh, on this reinsurance. Okay, so 3.239 plus 0.38 is 3.619. That's our total cost of the net position. Uh, compared to 3.63 was the gross premium. Uh, with no reinsurance cost. And so the difference is 0.011. So 
the reinsurance is a slightly better deal we lowered our total cost of risk by point zero one one five ok so that's the a b now what happens uh... if we look uh... in terms of allocation and actually there's a couple ways to do this we can start with our gross and look at uh, evaluate the seeded flow with respect to that portfolio so starting at gross is it worth uh, taking the reinsurance or we can start at net and look backwards at the seeded flows and ask is it worth is it worth our while or should we be dropping the reinsurance from the net position uh, and in each case we'll ask is the is the seeded cash flow uh, how does that compare to the reinsurance premium we're either going to have to pay or we're going to drop? Okay, so starting at the gross position, uh, again, we've got, uh, we're ordering on the gross losses. We've got our D of G that we already computed uh, in that sort order. We have our seeded cash flow, and across multiply, we get 0.456. So, uh, in the allocation of the gross required premium, uh, 0.456 of that is allocated to the seeded. And so this is greater than the 0.38 uh, reinsurance premium by 0.076. So what this is telling us is that we have uh, determined that the cash flows that we are contemplating seeding out uh, uh, require a premium of 0.456, but we only have to pay 0.38. So it looks like a really good deal, 0.076, really good deal, okay. Uh, and so now what about from the other end, from the net position? Okay, so now we have a sort order on the net, uh, applying our, uh, so the sort order on the seeded has changed as well. And so when we do the cross multiplication here, we're getting a required premium of 0.326. So here we are sitting at net, and we're looking at a possibility of picking up these seeded premiums. We're saying, uh, okay, well, if we, if we drop the reinsurance, we're going to have to take on these seeded premiums. And what is uh, the required premium for that? Well, the required premium appears to be 0.326. Uh, and that compares favorably uh, to the 0.38 that... Uh, uh, that we won't have to pay in reinsurance by 0.054. So that looks like we should drop the reinsurance because the seeded cash flows we're picking up uh, you know, aren't as costly to us as the reinsurance premium we're paying. So in summary, uh, the direct AB approach says, nah, it's a reinsurance is an okay deal, 0.011. Uh, if we start at gross and do the allocation method, it looks like a great deal. Reinsurance is a great deal, 0.076. Uh, if we start at net, uh, reinsurance is a bad deal. It's, uh, it's, we're losing 0.054 because we're buying reinsurance. And we're kind of stuck here with a little problem. Uh, what does this really mean? Uh, how do I explain this to my boss and, and his boss and uh, everybody else? Uh, what is going on here? All right, so let's dig a little deeper and see what's going on here. Let's talk about fractional participation. Let's imagine that we can buy this reinsurance. We can buy a piece of this reinsurance. We can buy uh, a fractional participation in it. Uh, anything from zero to 100 percent. Zero being corresponding to gross. Uh, T equals one corresponding to uh, full reinsurance purchase. And we're, just to make things easier, we're going to assume that the, the, with a fractional participation of T, that the premium would be pro rata as well. Now, you, you know, you could, if you, if you had a more complicated function in mind, you could plug it in here and do the analysis. But this is just for illustration, so we're just going to assume uh, a linear participation, linear premium. And so what we want to do is minimize the total cost of risk, which is... Uh, the spectral risk, you know, we're doing an AB method, so we're going to evaluate the net at T participation portfolio and add the T participation premium, and that'll be our total cost of risk. Now, instead of just zero or one, we're going to have the whole spectrum in between. Now, if we start at zero, and if we take the first derivative of our total cost of risk function, we see 
that we are looking exactly at the uh, allocation. The first derivative of the total cost of risk is the allocation computation we just did. Allocation is the gradient, as Steve mentioned. And the slope at t equals 0 is negative 0 0.76. So a, a, a unit increase in t, an, an, an epsilon increase in t, decreases our total cost of risk by 0 0.076 epsilon. Uh, and that is what the allocation is telling us at t equals 0. That that's the direction of this, uh, this function, this total cost of risk function. At the other extreme, uh, if we take the first derivative of our total cost of risk uh, at t equals 1, uh, we get exactly the allocation starting at the net portfolio. And there the slope is positive, that, a, that an epsilon increase in participation uh, is increasing our total cost of risk. Or conversely, if we did an epsilon decrease in participation, then we would be improving our position going back down. Uh, you know, going lower at that point. So, as you may have guessed, interpolating in between, this is what the full picture looks like. This is the total cost of risk uh, at all the levels of participation. And this is a very simple example very, with four scenarios, and there's, there's a flipping point where you have to resort, reorder the scenarios, and that occurs right there uh, at t equals 0 0.5, which is the optimal uh, level of participation. Now see, 100% is better than 0% by a little bit, but 50% would be the best. Uh, that would give you the minimum uh, total cost of risk. Now, this is, a, like I said, this is a very, very simple example. And, uh, oh, before I get into that, uh, what if, you know, if you had a different premium, uh, if the premium were uh, a little smaller, 0.31, uh, then, you know, this curve would shift uh, because, it's, you know, part of the curve is the, the the T times premium uh, cost of reinsurance. So uh, if the reinsurance cost were lower, then the curve would look like this. And then in that case, 100% would be the optimal uh, decision. But more generally, it, it's, it's going to be more complicated than that. You're going to have more scenarios, uh, more sorting. Uh, and so you're going to have a curve uh, that might look like this. And it might go all, you know, more often than not, it's going to go down all the way, saying reinsurance is good at 100%. Or it may go up all of the way, or most of the way, saying that, no, you don't want to buy anything. Uh, the interesting thing that goes on here is that if, if you're doing an optimization exercise, and then you came to this optimal point at the bottom, the allocation, the reinsurance allocation, reinsurance uh, premium allocation would equal the reinsurance premium, um, which uh, which shouldn't be a surprise, uh, you know, that's, that's how optimization works. You look for the zero derivative of your uh, objective function. Uh, but you might be tempted to say, well, wait a minute, if I'm at this point, uh, my, my benefit being the, the derivative of the spectral risk measure required premium uh, and the cost, the uh, reinsurance premium, are equal. So it's a wash. So, you know, I should be indifferent. Uh, as to whether I buy reinsurance or not. Well, no, that's not quite what it means. What it means is that you're at a point where moving in one direction or the other does not improve things. The actual benefit from reinsurance is that total vertical green arrow from your optimal position uh, to your gross position. That is the, the measure of the value of reinsurance. Now, a uh, more complicated situation, you may be looking at multiple contracts. Uh, I have layers. Uh, I have alternatives. Uh, uh, and so uh, you may be, not, instead of just a one-dimensional t equals 0 to 1, you may have a multiple, a multi-dimensional uh, t1, t2, t3, t4 uh, can be 0 to 1. And so as you're searching in that space, uh, you know, what, what we did here with t equals 0 to 1, it was a grid search. We did an A-B grid search. Now, if you have 10 contracts, uh, you have a 10-dimensional space to look at, uh, you're probably not going to do a grid search there. So what you're going to do instead is you're going to start at gross, uh, evaluate your allocations, and those will give you uh, directional derivatives as to how your total cost function is behaving. And so you follow 
the gradient uh, in, the, in the better directions. And you'll find yourself wandering through this 10-dimensional space looking for the ideal, uh, looking for the lowest cost uh, situation. So uh, there you'll be combining using the allocation method with using the AV method. So in summary, uh, allocation for decision making. The allocation is gradient. Uh, if you have a lot of AB situation to do, then the allocation is going to be a lot faster than the AB. It's, it's like using Taylor's theorem. Uh, it's okay for small changes, but it can be problematic when you're contemplating big changes. And going back to applying the modes, uh, in particular, uh, line of business assessment can get tricky. Again, you know, going back to the, the previous slide, uh, are you contemplating making big changes in your lines of business? Uh, in that case, uh, the allocations will help point you in the right directions, but they're not going to give you the definitive answer as to what happens with a big allocation. Uh, for that, you'd have to apply an A-B method to that. Uh, it, it gets even more complicated, too, because uh, this is, you know, the, the spectral risk measures here uh, and the allocations are all predicated on the idea that uh, there's a homogeneous change in the portfolio. Uh, if you double your auto business, uh, it may be reasonable to think that you're going to double uh, your expected losses, but it's not reasonable to think that uh, the coefficient of variation is going to stay the same. So it's an actual change in the shape of risk. So your modeling has to take that into account as well. Again, the allocation will be okay for giving you a direction, but if you're contemplating big changes, you need to use the AB method. And thank you very much.